Good evening, everybody. Uh, my name is uh, Jamie Fisher. I am a uh, faculty here at UC Davis in uh, German and Cinema and Digital Media, and I'm the director of the UC Davis Humanities Institute. Um, welcome and thank you all for coming to this, our opening screening uh, and event of our 2020 Human Rights Film Festival. Uh, before we get started, I would like to uh, give a hearty thank you to the DHI staff who really made this uh, possible tonight, uh, especially Gina Nunez and Elliot Pollard, who set up the uh, online festival. You know, unfortunately it has to be online, but I think they did a great job of making the festival kind of doable online. And I hope you've all found your way um, to the registration and to the films, uh, because, uh, which are available through our website at uh, the DHI. It's dhi.ucdavis.edu. Um, for the, our Human Rights Film Festival, uh, we undertake it every year in collaboration with the UC Davis Human Rights Studies Program, uh, chaired by uh, Professor Keith Wattenpah, who will participate in many of our events. Um, he'll be the interlocutor actually tomorrow evening for Born and Naveen, uh, as well as the Human Rights Watch Film Festival, um, with whom we consult about our choice of films. I'd also like to thank the film festival co-sponsors, including the Menede Shrum Museum here on campus, the Crocker Art Museum in Sacramento, the Bita Dar Yabari Endowment in Persian Language and Literature, which is a co-sponsor, especially for tomorrow's film, Born and Naveen, uh, and the, Hem the Hemispheric Institute on the Americas, as well as BAMFA, the Berkeley Art Museum and Pacific Film Archive down in Berkeley. Um, the UC Davis Humanities Institute is a leading voice on our campus for the essential value of the arts and humanities. And part of our mission is to underscore how the humanities and arts can, and we think should, contribute to debates and controversies in our broader society. Uh, films and other media uh, about human rights seem a crucial means for the humanities and arts to contribute to improving our contemporary world. For example, films, of course, allow us to travel to places we'll never be able to visit, and maybe of which we're not even aware even when they're in our own backyard, as tonight's film will explore uh, in Northern California. Such films also help us understand and empathize with people and entire peoples whose stories are often neglected uh, or even deliberately concealed. So tonight's film is uh, Gather from 2020. And uh, we have tonight for our event, um, the director of the film, Sanjay Rawal, um, who um, has spent 15 years working on human rights campaigns globally. He also ran initiatives for acclaimed artists and philanthropists one of whom encouraged him to start making films. Sanjay's first documentary, Food Chains from 2014, was produced by Ava Longoria and Eric Schlosser with narration by Forrest Whitaker. The film won numerous awards and was released theatrically in 40 cities by screen media and was acquired by Netflix. Sanjay's second effort took a sharp turn into non-traditional filmmaking. Applying narrative cinematic technique, Sanjay directed a sweeping expedition film. 3100 Run and Become was released theatrically in the US in 20 markets last fall. It is now opening uh, theatrically internationally. Sanjay's work has been supported by Ford, Bertha, BritDoc, Fledgling, 11th Hour Project, Novo, and the Omidyar Network. His work has won an assortment of honors, including a James Beard Media Award. So we're delighted to have him tonight. Um, and Sanjay will be in conversation with a uh, UC Davis graduate student, uh, Carly Dominguez, and I will read her, um, her bio in a second. Um, I just wanted to say that our format will be that Carly will ask questions for about 20 minutes uh, and then we'll, uh, 20, 25 minutes, then we'll open it up to the floor. Uh, and I wanna be sure to remind you all to use the Q&A function on uh, Zoom webinar. So Carly is in her first year as a PhD student in Native American studies here at UC Davis. She really recently earned a master's in American Indian studies at UCLA, where she focused on indigenous food security and sovereignty, ecosystem management and native women's storytelling and literature. At UCLA, she served as the co-president of American Indian Graduate Studio Student Association and co-founder of the California Indian Graduate Student Working Group. Ms. Dominguez has uh, interned with the Intertribal Agricultural Council, the Santa Inez Chumash Environmental Office, and USDA Natural Resources Conservation Service to generate Chumash uh, basketry plants and food systems for Santa Inez Valley Watershed. Currently, Ms. Dominguez designs re uh, research that engages with indigenous communities, American Indian tribes, and other stakeholders who are invested in supporting women's health, wellness, and food security based on indigenous agriculture and medicinal traditions, such as sustainable edible acorn food production, regeneration of salmon, deer, and elk populations, three sisters agriculture and tending of various other food and um, medicine plants. She's a recipient of UC Davis's Provost Fellowship Award in the Arts, Humanities, and Social Sciences and the Southwest Climate Adaptation Science Center Natural Resources Workforce Development Fellowship. We're delighted to have both of you. Thank you so much for doing this. 
Um, and we look forward to uh, this conversation. So uh, Carly, you wanna, wanna kick it off? Yes, thank you so much, Professor Fisher, for that uh, warm welcome. And thank you to all our sponsors. Welcome to everybody out there. Just wanna be as welcoming as possible as we meet virtually tonight. Um, I'm so excited to have this opportunity to ask uh, Sanjay Rawal some questions about, um, about his film Gather, which I just share um, antidotal information from the community as everybody's just loving it and really um, rejoicing hearing the stories of indigenous people throughout the US and um, looking at people providing their food systems. So that's really exciting. Um, so I guess I'll just go ahead and start off. Um, and this first question I wanted to relate back to the human rights um, initiative, you know, back to the human rights. And I wanna recognize that human rights have um, been violated um, within America's borders, but that's, that human rights have also been honored. And so I was thinking about um, how, um, just wondering about your opinion about some of the practical ways that you see these food sovereignty initiatives in indigenous communities as both embodying and honoring human rights and does it kind of serve as a remedy for any human rights violations that may have occurred? Well, Carly, first of all, it's an honor to, to be in this conversation with you. I mean, I should be the one asking you questions. Um, you're far more experienced and have much deeper expertise in all of these topics, not just by virtue of your indigeneity, but by virtue of your scholarship. I mean, I'll, I'll make a, a weak attempt at that question. I mean, the, the, the conundrum in America has always been the dichotomy between human rights goals and capitalism. And I'm not casting aspersions on the word capitalism, but it's important for people to know that America as a colony was created simply to enrich investors and governments that supported colonization. And pre-1860, the entire world's economy was, for the most part, concentrated on the soil. And so when, when Anglo-European colonizers came to the East Coast, they'd already heard that this wasn't the land of gold mountains, uh, which drove Spanish colonization. Um, but it was an agricultural wonderland. This was by no means a wilderness, but a huge area on the East Coast of interlocking farms and foraging and hunting ecosystems. And so it proved to be great fertile soil for crops like cotton, like tobacco, things that required massive amounts of land and subsequently massive amounts of labor. And so you see the violation of human rights and the theft of land as being essential to the rise of the colonies. And you see that argument in the development of the constitution, the Southern land owning, um, slave owning states versus more ecumenical Northern states. And again, the fact that the Iroquois Confederacy documents were the basis for the US constitution shouldn't go unnoticed. So as a country, we've been progressing to understand the role of capitalism and human rights together. And that's kind of wrapped in the new idea of economic justice. And that's where food sovereignty falls into place. It's like, you know, what rights do people have to control their own food system? What rights do people have to control an economic system that in the case of Indian country makes it incredibly difficult to grow your own food, to feed yourself, not to mention to preserve cultural traditions. Yeah, that's so important that you bring up economic justice um, connected to the food system. I think that that's a really, um, yeah, that, that's just so helpful when we think about human rights and maybe we think about economic justice in terms of human rights as well. And so I wanted to start with kind of a bigger, broader question and um, that I went through. And then, but, and then I wanted to bring it um, to a little bit of a, a human question um, with my experience working with food and indigenous ag. You know, um, I have to say, I love salmon from the Yurok and Hoopa people, and I love bison from the Yan River. So I'm thinking of those human um, connections that we have. And, and I'm just curious if you were able to um, 
share in any of the food with the people that you you interviewed or if your crew was able and if you want to share any of that experience with us because i think that th that really the quality of food <laughs> really you know gets to a, a more important piece of nutrition for everyone um, in the u.s currently yeah so just anecdotally right like there's only a couple activities that I think you can go any place in the world and find a way to share an experience in these two activities with people not knowing their language, not even knowing their backgrounds. Number one, running. I mean, running's always been an essential part of human culture. Um, and you can go anywhere in the world and find a running group and go for a run, explore a place with locals and come out of it a changed person with a bunch of new friends. And of course, sharing a meal is the other. And the interesting thing, of course, is when you go and meet a culture that doesn't just have a 10-year-old experience with, a, with a, an ingredient, but a 10,000-year-old plus relationship with an ingredient, it's not just from a spiritual or cultural standpoint, but purely physical. It's like things taste better. When we were with the Yurok and the Hoopa, despite you know a shortage of salmon, uh, despite you know the, these state moratoriums on fishing, everywhere we went, people wanted to share salmon, eel, other foodstuffs harvested, prepared by their own hands. And you know, in the greater American society, you kind of look at growing your own food, hunting your own food as things that are are not worthy of like middle class and upper class lifestyle. But at the same time, you know, coming from a, an Eastern tradition myself, you understand that the greater the knowledge is of an ingredient, the better it's gonna taste. And so, you know, like I'd only had bison burgers before and, you know, bison burgers, they are, there's not much fat in them, all the fat on the bisons between the, the flesh and the, and the skin, but on the Cheyenne River Lakota reservation, they kind of understood that using, you know, techniques like canning, which is not the way you'd ever buy meat at Whole Foods, but canning actually kind of creates that kind of confit where the fat renders into the meat and it makes a buffalo so much more flavorful. And so it's like, if I just went into it with the culinary standpoint, you would never think of the types of techniques that these, these um, tribal nations use to prepare these foods. But I got to taste these foods in the same way that their ancestors ate them. So it was a, it was a, a, it was a blessing, but I have to say, the, the only time when I was a little bit startled was on the San Carlos Apache Res, you know, when we went hunting for the Glostro, uh, the pack rat. And as much as I understood the cultural connection and the cultural significance of it, and I'm not, I'm not even mentioning this as a New Yorker who lives, you know, in a subway ecosystem with very unfriendly pack rats, but just the fact that the little thing was so cute made it really hard for me to initially enjoy it. But Twyla, the, the Twyla Cassidor from the movie, she didn't just serve us boiled flesh. She made a tamale out of it. Tamales are some of my favorite foods. And so, you know, that kind of helped me overcome the kind of cultural barrier I had with that ingredient. Thank you for sharing that. I, I think it's really helpful when we see, um, we see these indigenous foodways in in a movie to also hear people's experiences, um, you know, your experience beyond the movie about getting to know a little bit more about Apache food or your salmon and eel. Um, because I hope, you know, that we're working towards making these, um, these food ways, um, making them more accessible and growing them. And so that's one of the things I was also interested in asking you about. Um, you know, I know this is just an initial film and um, we'll see where things go, but I'm curious if you have some ideas or, or ways to share with some of the attendees today about how we can support and encourage these food systems wherever we might be, whether it's close to a reservation or, you know, maybe working with an indigenous community that doesn't have a reservation. If you learned anything about that while you were making your film, this film. Well, you know, my, my first film, Food Chains, was about a small group of farm workers in Immokalee, Florida, and they um, were displaced indigenous from Oaxaca, Chiapas, Guatemala, where, as Californians know, the pe people's first 
language isn't Spanish, their second language might not be Spanish either. And so I got a real look at the supply chain and how important the hands at the very base of the supply chain were and, and the expertise at the very base of those supply chains. I mean, we all think of our farmers or people at the farmer's markets as necessarily being the experts, but they might even defer to the people who work the fields as, as being those experts. And when it comes to native peoples, of course, it's like their knowledge of the food system is incredibly deep. It's more ecological knowledge than it's just agricultural knowledge. And so I, I would challenge people not to just do the kind of like land acknowledgement, which has become so in fashion now to begin meetings, but to actually understand the relationships that the indigenous people here today have with their land. And that might not be transactional, you know, that's like even going in saying, how can I help is transactional, but to make friends, to understand that, that there's a lot to learn and that learning comes from humility. It comes from a real attempt at, of being of service and listening and finding ways to either help or to stay out of the way. And it's to understand like the depth of your work that indigenous people are still here. They're still everywhere. They're still in every state and all of their issues are hyper local. So if you care about your local community and your local food system, chances are the issues in terms of policy that local indigenous groups are working on will affect you positively if those policy goals are met. I mean, in California, for example, as, as people may or may not know, but like the Trinity River is dammed and a lot of the water is shunted to, to, um, to irrigate central California. Um, the river is pretty unhealthy and the Yurok and Hoopa tribes are trying desperately to work on policies that will affect those rivers. Yes, there'll be short-term ramifications for water usage in the Central Valley, but hypothetically, it might push the Central Valley farming system to look at more regenerative opportunities and to look at systems that will be more in tune with the long-term health of California. So even then, like hyper-local native issues can, if seen through the proper multi-decade lens have deep and powerful impacts on society. Yes, I'm so glad that, um, that you mentioned that about um, looking at the conventional agriculture and, and, and looking to regenerative principles. And I know that you have uh, a lot of experience with the human rights institutions and programs. So, and you've talked a little bit about this, but uh, I was just wondering if you could some of the barriers that you've seen that prevent Indigenous people, like the Apache, like the Yurok and Lakota, um, some of the barriers that they've experienced when they want to perpetuate these ecologically sustainable food systems. And of course, on the other hand, uh, you do share in, in the film, but if you want to speak a little bit more about how you've seen people leverage resources and collaborations to, in, to initiate and continue these local um, Indigenous ecologically sustainable food systems. Um, that, 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 that's the great thing about successful human rights movements. You know, as, as much as people in the movement might communicate that, you know, they, they, they want to take over the world, or maybe that, that's the fear from third parties, people are just looking for a seat at the table. When we look at the environmental movement, when we look at the regenerative farming movement, when we look at basically most agricultural movements in the United States, the leadership is pretty homogeneous. And this isn't even to discuss the, the ancestral land transfer that's enabled these people to have a seat at the table. It's not even to mention the farming policies that are deeply racist that prevent other people from having a seat at the table. So basically it's like most groups I've worked with aren't asking for things to return the way they were 500 or a thousand years ago. They're just asking for their rightful seat. And the amazing thing is that when you have diversity in terms of leadership, especially in, in environmental movements, you have solutions that are much more rooted in traditional practices that have a much longer history, proven history of working, um, particularly involving indigenous people, you get a much, much deeper sense of the ecological tricks and secrets of lands. I mean, not to mention in California, the most obvious one is fire prevention, fire suppression techniques and understanding the natural rhythm of fire in California. That 
never, it was the policies never happened because indigenous people weren't given seats at the table, much less leadership. So I think diversifying, you know, the voices at the table is important. Leadership obviously is critical, but just that first step would be such an important way to make a better society for everyone. I mean, when you look at the, the reasons why, you know, people like the Apache and the, you know, other tribes, their solutions aren't being taken seriously, it's because the deciding bodies don't have not just indigenous representation, but really much representation at all. Okay, so considering leadership, supplying leadership so people can collaborate and work together. Thank you for, for that suggestion in that direction. And we are seeing a little bit of, we are seeing that shift in some, in some areas. Um, and that actually kind of leads me, I think this will be my last question before we go to the uh, attendees questions, which is that I really admire um, your ability, the film's ability to capture the storytelling from the people. Like I do really feel like I'm sitting with them, listening to them. Um, and you know, the other side to storytelling is listening, right? So, um, and, and I, I could see that related to you, um, to this, your response about changing leadership and listening to stories from native people. So I was wondering how, um, like how important both storytelling and listening to stories is when we are addressing human rights and in particular, particular in the indigenous communities that you document. Oh, you and Professor Fisher will be experts on this, but you know, the, as people may or may not know, the, the first documentary was, um, by an Anglo-American fellow named Robert Flaherty. It was called Nanook of the North, 1929 production. And he was, he was doing it for the first time. So, you know, I, I, it's, it's hard to really be critical about that. And, you know, you know to, to everyone's um, knowledge, you know, this film about this Inuit man um, who was named Nanook in the movie was done very much with the participation of Inuit elders, et cetera. But what it spawned, which is, you know, which is without, without argument, is an industry where people flew into indigenous communities and peasant communities, exotic communities around the world, took a story, went and shared it with the world. And the effect of that has been that indigenous communities throughout the Western hemisphere have tended to learn about indigenous people through media created by non-indigenous. And so as a non-native, I was, extraordinarily wary of the privilege I have as a filmmaker in making this story. At the same time, I would not have dared even suggest this topic had it not come from an, an organization I deeply admire, the First Nations Development Institute, who was very much my partner in this project. I said, I can help make a film, I can help tell stories, but it's like, I can't make this an indigenous film. And the goal first and foremost was to make a film that Indian country and indigenous communities would feel were their own. But in terms of filmmaking process, I always look at my characters as experts, whether they're farm workers or the ultra distance indigenous runners I showcased in my last film, 3100, um, or this film. It's like, you know, for all the incredible native agricultural professionals out there, professors, lawyers, et cetera, my viewpoint was like, no expert opinions, no talking heads unless we were filming them on the ground, like in their environment, they are my experts. And I am just going to do as much as I can as a storyteller to capture the visual and emotional arc of their life. You know, if people wanna learn about food sovereignty, they shouldn't watch Gather. You know, they should read a book. You know, they should read the research out there. Filmmaking is inherently so limited, but what we can do you know, to an almost equal, if not greater degree than poets can, that songwriters can, is really provide deep and affecting emotion. And hopefully that was the perspective we captured. And, and I, in, at least in my own filmmaking career, when you focus on people's expertise in times when they're not talking, that will translate into completely different experiences for viewers, whether they're newbies or whether they're elders, I think people get something out of this type, these types of movies just because our characters are so rich in experience and you can feel that, I think, even when they're not speaking. 
yeah, I definitely felt the, the, the richness of, of everyone's experience, as well as the humanity and range of the stories, which we didn't get to talk too much about, but the, um, the people in the film do talk about what, what life is like in general on their reservation. So they're talking about some of the things like suicide and diabetes rates, um, and then what and then what um, food sovereignty has done to help them. So there's, it's definitely, I, I definitely felt like this film captures a bigger picture than um, just the food sovereignty. And so now I'll go ahead and move to questions from our attendees. Thank you so much for submitting the questions. We have a question from Professor Wattenpa. Uh, they asked if you can update us on the participants in the film, especially the Europe River Guardians, Chef Nepi, Twyla and many others in the film. Is Cafe Gozo still going in the current challenging circumstances? So yeah, you know, and, and the professor will, will already be kind of an expert on, on supply chains, but you know, people know that, you know, grocery stores are at the end of supply chains. And those supply chains are built on highways. Native communities have traditionally been pushed as far away from those highways, which were railroad tracks at one point and urban centers as possible. So their quality of food has always been really poor. Um, at the same time with a lot of supply issue, chain issues that COVID created, it's caused some pretty deep food security issues, starvation issues in some tribal communities. And so tribal communities in a nutshell have been hit really, really hard. Sammy Jensaw, his brothers, um, the ancestral guard have had to kind of pivot and become a, a, a food bank, so to speak. I mean, the Yurok aren't traditionally farmers, but they've set up some 90 some odd gardens. Um, they're delivering like a CSA type uh, service right now. Elsie Dubray, you know, she's a, a junior now at Stanford, but you know, because of COVID closures, her cohort's not actually on campus right now. And so she can't actually continue her studies without access to lab. So she's kind of taking an effective summer break to learn to, deepen her Lakota language skills. Um, Twyla, you know, on the San Carlos Apache Reservation in Arizona, they've had some pretty severe lockdowns and without really getting into it, the corollary for the school to prison pipeline in African-American communities is the food to prison pipeline. You know, the hunting restrictions uh, that people saw in, in the film and gather that, that took place in fishing communities in the seventies. Those, those policies are still in effect now. Um, from what I understand, a lot of fish and game um, uh, officers actually don't need warrants for arrests or for fines. And so in Arizona, acorn foragers have been fined more than $1,000 for breaking COVID restrictions, going off their reservation to get food. Um, that's affected Twyla and her community pretty significantly. And Nephi, you know, the restaurant had a soft open when we filmed it in January and February of 2020, but because White Mountain Apache was hit as hard, if not harder per capita than the more publicized um, tragedies on the Navajo Nation, they closed down temporarily and they can't really sustain um, operations until, you know, everything in that section of Arizona is up and running. So they're continuing trainings Nephi's on Instagram. He's doing, you know, cooking classes every Wednesday night. He calls it Wu Tang Wednesday. So people are still doing their own things. In some ways, you know, work is broadened. In some ways, work has been severely curtailed. All right. So we can stay up updated at Wu Tang Wednesdays on Instagram if we want to. It sounds like. Thank you for sharing that with us. Um, the next question is from. Um, well, I don't know who it's from, but it, the question is, how did you find the participants and collaborators in the film? Were they difficult to find? Were they immediately willing to participate? So that's a, there's a lot to unpack in that. Number one, it's trust. I would have never been able to make any sort of movie that was relevant if I didn't have the full participation of the First Nations Development Institute. Uh, they've been working as grant makers in Indian country as a native led organization for almost 40 years, if not 40 years. And so they actually had relationships with a lot of the communities that we went to. So we always had folks to connect with in those communities that understood our intentions and that we could just sit and have honest, open conversations with. You know, I, I initially wanted to choose areas of the country that had the, the most horrific um, 
impact by the by the U.S. military. You know, I wanted to find stories in the plains, in the Apacheria, and in Northern California. Um, at the same time, like our my method for choosing characters was simply like how well could they transmit their essence into a screen. And so even in my initial interviews with people, I'm trying to imagine them on a screen and how emotive they were and what they would look like. And this is not, you know, um, a, a beauty standard or a body type standard. It's a, mag it's a magnetic quality. And so as soon as I met Sammy and his brothers, just by chance, you know, on the, on the ancestral land of a, of a friend um, in near Fort Bragg on the Noyo Pomo reservation or, or land, you know, I met Sammy and like, I was like, this kid's got something like, you know, he's talking the talk and I, I know that he's walking the walk, but he's somebody that we need to, to follow. And the same thing with Twyla, you know, our, our methodology was to actually have our initial meetings with potential characters while they were working. So we could feel what it was like to be with them. So in that sense, it was a bit academic. It was a lot more emotional. Um, and I guess that emotional perspective is what I bring to the table as a, as a professional filmmaker, I suppose. All right, our next question is from Jeremy Dantzler. What can people do on both the macro and micro level to ensure food sovereignty in all communities? That's a great question. I mean, people should, should connect with you if they wanna find out what to do about food sovereignty in indigenous communities, particularly those in California. As a, as a non-native, the question is what is food sovereignty? Um, number one, it's an understanding of the types of foods my great, great, great grandparents had in India before, and I won't even use the word colonization, before a colonial food system, how did they take care of themselves? Because my genes, were based on, on, on the foods they ate. If any one of my ancestors hadn't been able to digest the food in their immediate environment, they would have died and they wouldn't have been able to pass on their genes. So someone's stewardship of some village somewhere in India created the genetic strength that I have today to survive. That said, it's like, if you live in a community that can't feed itself during a pandemic, during a supply chain disaster, do you even have food security? I mean, we, we found during COVID that there's a lot of rural communities that perhaps didn't even have food security. Those communities need to understand that there were ways to live off the land. There were ways to live in harmony, in food harmony with their environment. And I would suggest you know, that type of exploration in cities as well because the environment is no use to us if it can't provide us food. And so UC Davis is different because you're you know, in an agricultural district, but most people in the country have no idea where their food comes from, how it's grown, how it's produced, understand the work that's required. And so it's like, we look at the food system as convenience. In fact, you know, US food policy is just set up for convenience and you know, economic freedom not for long-term benefits for soil, for environment, and for health. And so food sovereignty in a community is a deep question. The, lo the long answer is to just say like, know who's providing your food. It's like, no, not just the, the, the farmers at the, at the farmer's market, know, who, know your grocery store workers, figure out the most local ways you can eat, the lo most local restaurants you can support, seek out, wisdom in your communities, find the grannies that have the thousand year old traditions from their villages and figure out ways to propagate those in your community. And that's what a modern food sovereignty will look like. Like I, I volunteer every night at a local health food store in Queens and our community is Pakistani, Bangladeshi, Jamaican, Guyanese, West African and Greek. And it's like if people can agree on anything in this world, it's good food. And so the conversations and the herbs that people share, you know, I was also in a community that was the most one of the most devastated in the US by COVID, but all the home remedies, you know, all of the concoctions, all of the knowledge 
that came out of people being genuinely poor and without access to healthcare showed the reliance that we can have on the land and what happens to us in terms of health and longevity when we do rely on the land in a more direct way. Thank you. So we have a related question from Alexis Road. She was wondering how people who aren't part of indigenous communities can help preserve buffalo populations, specifically in our local areas. You know, it's a great question. Like there's a there's one line in the film where Elsie's dad, Fred Dubray, says that says that exact point. Like, you know, that non-indigenous people, and I'm I'm, I'm assuming the, the the that Alexis isn't an indigenous, and she might be, so forgive me, you know, Alexis. But my perspective is, is, is as a non-native. Um, so Fred said, you know, non-indigenous people can understand the environmental reasons why we would want buffalo back, but they can't, and they can't understand the native reasons. And so what I would say for those of us who aren't parts of indigenous communities who want to preserve buffalo populations, make sure natives are in charge because they, they will care more about those buffalo than we ever could, because it's their identity. You know, it's who their grandparents were, it's who their great, great grandparents were. Not to say that we can't help and that we can't even be equals at the table in terms of knowledge that we bring, that we can't fill gaps and provide resources. But if they have equal footing or are in charge, chances are we'll have a much greater chance at success. All right. Our next question is from an anonymous attendee. They are wondering if you feel food sovereignty for indigenous communities means that there shouldn't be processed food at all, as in the film processed unhealthy food was shown to be holding back food sovereignty. You know, the, the obvious answer is like, nobody should have to have processed food as their only alternative. And I think that's a question like, you know, you can fight me for my Oreos. Like, I'm not gonna give up my Oreos. But then again, it's like, if Oreos were the only food that I had access to, like, woe is me. Um, so the, the issue isn't so much that there is processed food, but there aren't economically viable alternatives. There, as First Nations did a, a study of, food, of, of convenience stores and grocery stores and on the res, Obviously milk and eggs and tomatoes were more expensive than off the res, but on the res, Gatorade and hot Cheetos were 20% cheaper than the average price off the res. And that includes rural American communities. Native populations have always been dumping grounds for sugar, salt, and fat. In fact, the first big native boarding school, the Carlisle Indian School was where the first and I, I don't want to use the word experiment because it sounds insidious, but looking back at it, it was pretty insidious. Most native communities began to rely on army rations because as a tactic of subjugation, they were forced to live close to army forts. Army forts really only had rations. They had flour, they had oil, they had coffee. They had a simple diet that a soldier could subsist on for the one or two year rotation. But at the Carlisle Indian School, they decided to implement these same foodstuffs into the daily regiment for three, four, five, ten 10 years. They saw how addictive it was. They saw how easy it was to create a diet of these processed food. And they realized how economically viable it would be to project that onto the entire American population. So my, my, my answer is like, nobody should have to suffer with processed foods as their only choice. None of us can achieve food sovereignty if that's the only thing that we have. And so our battle is making the food system affordable. You know, it's making corn and beans and squash and tomatoes as cheap in impoverished, oppressed areas as hot Cheetos are. It's providing people the knowledge they, they might not have to like cook those ingredients rather than even spending more than beans and rice to go to McDonald's or to Kentucky Fried Chicken. So it's, it's a combination of subsidizing, it's a combination of changing palates, at the same time, most of the solutions to these problems exist within communities. It's like in Detroit, food access issues were surmounted by people getting access to 
unused pieces of land to grow their food again. Indian communities all have their own solutions. There are just a whole raft of impediments, policy-wise, supply chain-wise, economically, that are preventing their access to food as a human right. Yeah, I'm really glad that you bring up that, you know, that, that there are similar, that indigenous and non-indigenous people, we all have that similarity of, of, it's a human right to access healthy food. I think that's really important. And you just want to share with the indigenous communities I work with, I mean, you know, if, not, if we're not eating well and nobody's eating well, that hurts everyone. You know, there really is still, we still feel a responsibility to feed everyone well who's on our homelands. You know, that responsibility has never been given up despite these barriers that we encounter. So I really agree. And, and we consider both Indigenous and non-Indigenous people in that. So just really appreciate you bringing that up. Um, so Harley Perry asks, uh, what is the American government doing, if anything, to combat the rates of drug abuse and suicide about which one hears about in the film? I don't know if the government is doing anything. You know, it's, it's literally, and, and again, I'm not trying to sound like some conspiracy theorist here, but it's literally not in the government's best interest to invest in the longevity of Indian populations. You know, the U.S. system has always wanted native land from the East Coast to the West. You know, native lands now that were considered unfarmable tend to have a lot of rich resources on them. Um, native lands tend to be, you know, in prime locations for water control, water resources. There's always pipeline, you know, projects across the U.S. There are always coal mining and other sorts of intensive um, rare earth mineral, other mineral mining that just happens to be, you know, concentrated around Indian country. And so while there might be piecemeal projects, charity projects, religious driven projects, you know, in a sense, using the words of Sammy Jensen on the movie, it's like native populations are still experiencing long term genocide, you know, put it this way. If, if there are a couple of policies out there to prevent drug abuse or the spread of drugs and other you know, effects of colonization in Indian country, you know, there are by no means an equal number of policies to promote food sovereignty, to promote farming rights, to promote access to capital. It's like access to capital, right to, to grow your own food, right to food sovereignty, you know, right to energy, right to your own water, those are the policies that will fight drug abuse, that will fight suicide. It's not so much the Band-Aid perspective that we tend to have um, with most problems. There is actually a set of policies that's restricting normal growth and normal strengthening of these communities. That, that would be my answer. I think it's a great question. Don't get me wrong. I didn't mean to get so, so chippy about it. All right, so we are gonna have to close up just maybe one last question. Um, an anonymous attendee asked, was there a storyline that you wanted to have in the film but didn't have enough time to cover? Are there any changes you would have made to the film? You know, I, I, I will use that to shine the spotlight a little bit onto you, Carly. Um, people in California might not know, but most of California native issues are I wouldn't even say influenced, but they're overseen by the women in California native tribes. It's not just that they're matriarchal societies, but it's like, it just happens that the women in charge just happen to be incredibly smart as well. So it's like, when you meet a California native woman, you might not realize how networked she is into environmental issues, leadership issues. And for all the talk about like, putting natives at the table. In California, it's the native women that are already kind of at the table, you just might not know it. So I would encourage people to learn more about Carly's work, to ask her about the, the organizations in California that are led by indigenous women and learn how to support that because it's like you will have a stronger state you know, once those women get more resources. I mean, that, that, I would have liked to tell their story, but their story is not mine to tell. <laughs>
Awesome. I love it. I love listening to California Native women tell their stories and make leadership decisions. Um, so we, I guess we are, we do have time for a few more questions. Um, somebody did ask me, um, Harshini Bondi asked, do you think there's anything significant about the food sovereignty movement that's misunderstood by non-natives? Um, I think uh, we went over it a little bit today and I think your film goes over it. Just to remember that in every, every place we are um, throughout the US, there's a native community, there's an indigenous community and we all have ecological traditions and food systems that we would like to revive and regenerate. And, and you know, also keeping in mind we're working through barriers just like everyone. So um, keeping in, in, um, in mind the humanity and the friendship making actually that Sanjay mentioned, <laughs> friendship making is really awesome and helpful. Um, and uh, the last question from Professor Wentenpa, he wants to know what your, ne your next or your ongoing project is, Sanjay. Well, I, 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 I wish I had something in mind. Um, I've just been focusing on getting this film out. You know, we didn't realize that non-native communities would have any interest in this topic because it's like food sovereignty. Like I didn't even really know the depth of what that meant before I made this film. Um, and we're just heartened that people are watching the film. Um, it's on iTunes, it's on Amazon. At some point next year, we'll be on Netflix. And I'm hoping that this will, this watching this film will spark some really interesting conversations around the uh, hopefully virtual turkey table at the end of the month that people share. Yes, you've definitely given us some conversation for the for the um, the gatherings that people <laughs> um, people celebrate at the end of November. I think you've given us some good information to consider indigenous food sovereignty, indigenous food systems, getting to know the local indigenous people in our area. So thank you so much for bringing this film to us and thank you to the UC Davis Human Rights Festival for everyone attending. Please um, remember to go ahead and check them out. They've still got films going on until the 24th and there's panels and this has been so wonderful and great and I look forward to other conversations and the work that we'll do after we uh, integrate all this important information. Thank you, everyone. Thanks so much, everyone. And thank you so much, Carly. Mm -hmm. <laughs>